the first set of problems, yes? Okay, so we're on the second set of problems. And the second set of problems is meant to generate a discussion. Um, so, who feels in a talkative mood? Mr. Hayden, do you feel talkative? Uh, not particularly. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let me set it up for you. So, what's happening in this problem is that you have a country that relies exclusively on import duties. And now it wants to um, diversify its revenue base. So um, this is the problem on page 23, if anyone um, needs to look. So it says um, that here's a country. It has um, nothing but import duties. So remember, we were talking about how import duties are a very efficient way for a lot of countries to tax. Because one of the big issues in taxation is administrative capacity. So we live in a country where the government can and apparently does like know every phone call you make, every website you go to. So we have a country with a lot of administrative capacity. But not every country has a lot of administrative capacity. And for many countries, um, that creates a big problem in terms of taxation. So it's like Al Capone when they said, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's because that's where the money is. You have to go to where the money is. And one thing that most countries can at least control a little bit is their borders, or at least the borders where most of the goods are coming through. Now, I know that's hard for us to believe since we have all these drugs coming through our borders, but you just have to go with it. Okay, so countries that can control their borders tend to like import duties because it meets one of the requirements of taxation, which is don't tax anybody who has any political clout, right? So the, the goods are coming in from foreigners, and so those foreigners don't have political clout or tend not to have political clout within your borders, and so it's don't tax you, don't tax me, tax the man behind the tree. So import duties tend to be very efficient. However, there's something called the World Trade Organization. And the World Trade Organization had something called the GATT which has now developed into the GATS. So the GATT, I'm buying you as much time as I can. I'm trying here. OK, so the GATT is the general agreement on tariffs and trade. And this um, general agreement on tariffs and trade did a lot to just destroy the um, most import duties. Because um, governments that signed on to this general agreement then had to give up their import duties. The GATS, on the other hand, is the general agreement on trade in services. And this is meant to do for professional services what the GATT did for goods. So the idea of the GATT was that goods should be able to flow freely across borders without tax. And the idea of the GATTs 
is that professionals should be able to work freely across borders so that doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, um, who in our world at this moment, we can't even, if you're licensed in um, Tennessee, you can't even practice in Kentucky, right, without going through something. But um, if the GATS really takes off, you'll be able to practice in Singapore, or you'll be able to practice in Zimbabwe or whatever. Now, the one thing where this is working now in terms of lawyers is that there's an agreement between Singapore and the United States that allows people who graduated from Columbia Law School, Columbia University Law School, to practice in Singapore without further licensure. So. It's only four law schools. Columbia's one. I can't remember what the other three are. No. Isn't that something? And actually, the Association of American Law Schools, there's something called the US Trade Representative. And this US trade representative is supposed to um, represent all of American industry in terms of getting fair trade deals in the rest of the world. And so the Association of American Law Schools wrote to the US trade representative, who was the one who negotiated this deal, and said, you, don't, you shouldn't have done that because your obligation is to represent everyone. Your obligation is not to create winners and losers. And what is it about Columbia Law School that they should be able, that their graduates should be able to practice in Singapore and not others? Apparently, the US Trade Representative didn't care and didn't listen. OK. So the point is that this country was dealing with import duties. And now it's trying to diversify its, um, its tax base. And it's trying to diversify its tax base with a bicycle tax. So now what would we call, if we were talking about sales taxes, excise taxes, wealth transfer taxes, what sort of a tax is this um, bicycle tax, Mr. Hayden? Well, the license would be the way that the tax would be effectuated, right? So you might do it through a license. What would be another way that you might do it? I was thinking toll roads would be easier. OK, so toll roads, remember that toll roads, they would be easier. They wouldn't just catch bicycles, though, right? They would be more likely to catch cars, because bicycles could probably skirt the toll roads, right? But toll roads are a time-honored way of raising revenues. I think that I mentioned that um, in Ethiopia, in ancient, the Abyssinian kingdom, they had um, very elaborate toll roads, and that's how they collected their taxes. But all I'm saying is, if you had to categorize, like remember we said we have sales taxes, excise taxes, wealth taxes, transfer taxes, imports and duties. Does anybody remember anything else that we had on that list? I'm just going off the top of my head. Well, if you had to pick from this, and some of these we said were indirect, and some of these we said were direct taxes. From this list, what would you say a tax on bicycles would be? Uh, it is an excise tax. Okay, remember that an excise tax is to remember that the way that you differentiate taxes is by the base and the trigger, the trigger being what prompts the tax, right? And an excise tax is prompted by a sale. So is there a sale in this situation? Uh, what sale? The license. 
Okay. It's, well, first of all, we haven't yet said it was a license, right? You just decided that you wanted to effectuate the tax through a license. But um, if, there were, if it required a sale, would it be a direct tax or an indirect tax? Okay, remember that direct taxes are taxes on the thing, and indirect taxes are taxes on transactions in the thing. Uh, okay. so if we're selling a bike, it If we were selling a bike, it would be an indirect tax. So you want to make this a tax on the sale of bikes? Because now I'm starting to understand why you're saying some of the things that you're saying. So when you, when you hear bicycle tax, you're hearing a tax on the sale of bicycles. I was thinking more like a registration system. I feel like that would be easier to police and actually. OK, so a registration system would be a little different from a tax. Now, some people would say that registration systems and licenses are taxes. A license gives you the right to drive the bicycle or the right to, to have the bicycle on the road. A registration gives the um, state a um, idea of your ownership of the, um, of the bicycle, whether you ride it or not, right? What they're talking about in terms of a bicycle tax is that merely by owning a bicycle, you are required to pay a tax. So if you have a situation where merely by owning a bicycle, whether you ride it or you don't ride it, you are forced to pay a tax. What sort of a tax would that be? So the trigger is ownership. Okay. The trigger is ownership. So is it a direct tax or an indirect tax? Uh, indirect. Okay, if it's just ownership, it's a direct tax because it's a tax on the thing, right? It's not a tax on any transaction in the thing. So whether you own the whether you own it or not. Um, Right, exactly. So for example, in our country, in Connecticut, there is a um, tax on stock, and that would be a wealth tax. In Florida, there's a tax on cars, whether or not the cars are registered. Just by f virtue of the fact that you own the car, you uh, um, have to pay, and the tax is based on the value of the car. That is also um, a wealth tax. So, I'm sorry, well, I just gave it away. Okay, so it's, this would be a direct tax on wealth. All right, a bicycle tax is a direct tax on wealth. Mr. Nixon? Okay, so um, Mr. Nixon, since this is a direct tax on wealth, um, well, not since it's a direct tax on wealth. Now that we've established that it's a direct tax on wealth, let's go back to what Mr. Hayden was talking about, which is what would make, um, how would you be able to effectuate this tax? So Mr. Hayden has mentioned a couple of different ways of doing it, right? One thing he said is, let's require a license. Another thing he said is, maybe we'll require registration. What was the third thing you said, Mr. Haid? Uh, oh, on your return. Or you might have to report it, report ownership on an annual return. So in this state, Mr. Nixon, um, do you have a car? Uh, I do. Okay. And is it registered in the state? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't think so. 
Oh, okay. So that would be a problem then in answering this question. Does somebody have a car registered in the state? Oh, this is a trip. Okay. <laughs> No, 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 because I, it actually requires you to have knowledge of what goes on in the state in terms of, um, well, I don't know what goes on in your state. But, okay, so here's a problem. Let's say, so when you get a license for a car, right, you get a plate, right? Mm -hmm. And what is the point of the plate? Well, it's to identify the car, but it's also to let the police know that your car is licensed, right? I mean, because if you didn't have the plate, then they wouldn't know that it was licensed. But now, once you get the plate, if it's an annual tax, how do they know that you've paid the tax every year? Well, but that would be very complicated, right? Like if you're, if you're driving by the police officer, he would have to like get the number, put the number in the computer, check the number. So the only way he would know is if he pulled you over, right? right. How is there a way for him to know the moment you pass by that you've paid or not paid in this year? And that's probably what's going to happen in years in the future, right? Where you would just have, he could just point at it and figure it out. We haven't gotten to that point yet, so what does he have to do now? Um, I mean, you could have... Mr. Martucci wants to help you out. Do you want to let him? So, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have to renew the registration every year. You do, but how does he know? They use a stamp. Remember we talked about stamp taxes? And how a stamp tax is not a tax itself, it's a proof of the payment of a tax. So stamps are one way. License, having a license plate and having a stamp are both ways that government officials can know immediately whether or not you've paid a tax. Okay, so, so far what we know is that this bicycle tax is a direct tax on wealth. And we have a couple of different ways that we might uh, require the reporting of this tax. So now, um, Mr. Martucci, what are some of the um, issues that we read about in terms of what sort of things you might consider when you uh, um, are thinking about a, uh, um, a tax, right? So this guy has said to uh, um, the king, well, let's have a bicycle tax. So, I mean, I guess the king could say, okay, let's have a bicycle tax. If he wants to be a little bit more thoughtful about it, what are some of the things he might want to think about? Okay, well, that's already getting into, all right, we, whoa, sorry. All right, we're going to have a bicycle tax, right? But if he's still thinking about a bicycle tax, what might be some of the things that he would think about? I mean, crass things. What, why do you have a, a tax at all? Okay, so that's where I was getting the crass part, okay? Why is he going to have a tax on bicycles? If there are three bicycles in the city, why is he going to have a tax on bicycles, right? So the first thing you want to ask yourself is revenues, right? Because taxes are very dangerous. It, you can get killed if you have the wrong tax. We've seen this over and over again, right? People who will take any sort of other abuse will refuse to take abuse when it comes to taxes. So at the very least, you want to know that it's a moneymaker, right? If it's not a moneymaker, there's no point. 
Um, and then, what was the next thing you said, Mr. Martucci? <laughs> you were saying uh, well, revenue. How it's going to impact how much people like. Okay. So, and then you want to know, will it um, discourage an activity? And is this an activity that you want to discourage? So, um, Mr. Marshall, what do you think? Um, what do we want to discourage? Yeah, I mean, as opposed to some other thing that we might want to encourage or discourage. Um, well, usually, like most, most cities now are very pro biking. You're, you're getting bikes, <coughs> um, things like that. Yeah. Right, yeah, it seems like sort of a wacky thing, right? It seems like if you're going to tax something, why would you be taxing bikes, right? I mean, here we are trying to reduce the um, reduce pollution, increase people's uh, um, exercise, all these other things, and yet you come up with a tax that seems to go against that, right? So, uh, Mr. Wu, what other things might you think about? I mean, when you're evaluating the tax. So one of the things we thought about is, are we going to raise any revenues? Another thing is, is it going to discourage an activity we want to encourage? What else might we um, be thinking about? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we might actually want to discourage the activity, right? right? So we want to know if it'll raise money. We want to know, is this an activity we want to discourage? And if we put a tax on it, will we discourage it? And what else might we want to know, Mr. Wu? Like what? Okay, is this going to be simple or complex? Yeah, it seems that some of the um, suggestions that Mr. Hayden made could make it simpler, right? If you had a license plate, if you had an annual stamp, you could probably tell pretty quickly whether or not somebody had paid the tax or hadn't paid the tax. So. Um, some of the issues, is it going to raise enough revenues? Is it going to discourage an activity we want to encourage, or is it going to discourage an activity we want to discourage? Is it going to be simple or complex to administer? Um, Mr. Marshall, what might be another issue? Oh, I just asked you, right? Oh, OK. The fairness. OK. So now, when we say fairness, what are some of the concepts that we use for fairness in um, our income tax system? Uh, we talked about uh, the vertical equity. Okay, so we have vertical equity, which means that the rich pay more. And we have horizontal equity. which means that people in the same income pay the same tax. So 
in terms of a bicycle tax, Mr. Pate, what do you think? Would that, would it um, support vertical equity? Would it mean that the rich paid more? Um, yes, and in fact, if the rich own cars and poor people own bicycles, it's actually going to be regressive, right? Because poor people will pay a tax, the rich people won't. Okay, what about horizontal equity? Well, it would be the same if everybody in the same income had the same number of bicycles, right? But if you have one person who's making $10,000 and they walk everywhere, and another person who's making $10,000 and they have a bicycle, then those two people have the same income, but they're going to pay a different tax. So in general, wealth taxes um, are not, don't fit this model unless you're talking about really focusing on wealth that's, that richer people have, right? So if you had um, a luxury tax, a tax on luxury vehicles, then you'd have a more vertical equity. And in order to have horizontal equity, you would have to have a tax on something that everybody owns, or that everybody in a certain income class owns. Um, what might be another, um, another issue, Ms. Smith? Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. <laughs> we have the two Ms. Smiths? Um, <laughs> I know, OK. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, Ms. Okay. Taylor. Um, let's, okay, Ms. Taylor, let's go with you. <laughs> what is, <laughs> uh, just, you know, the potential political ramifications, I guess that could relate to discouraging the activity, but, you know, if there would be big um, criticism of the decision, the implementation of this task. Okay, so the politics, do people think it's fair? Okay, the other thing I was looking for is transparency. Remember, we talked about how um, one of the questions is, is a tax um, transparent or is it um, not? So that, for example, our sales taxes tend to be transparent because you can actually see on the bill. And another is neutrality. So, um, with neutrality, the, what you're looking for is that you won't have any distortions in how people spend based on the tax. And the only way to, uh, um, to develop neutrality is to have as broad a base as possible. So if everything is taxed in the same way, then people are not going to have any um, difference as to whether they buy cars or bicycles or whether they walk or, you know, it's, does that make sense? The broader the base of the tax, the more likely it is to be neutral. Okay, well that's it for that problem. So, um, ay, 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 ay. So, Ms. Smith, did we scare you enough that you're ready to go? Okay. So, the first Ms. Smith, I'm sorry. So, um, let's try problem one three, which is on what page? 28. Okay. So, what happens to this problem is that you have the husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Burke, come to your office. 
they've learned that um, there's going to be an IRS examination of the years 2006 to 2007. And they want you to represent them. Now, remember that in that case, what happened was that Mr. S uh, Burke had, uh, um, hi, Mr. Burke had, uh, um, forged a tax return. He, well, he had not forged a tax return. He had forged Mrs. Burke's signature. And now Mrs. Burke has discovered the forgery. And the question is, can you represent them both? So what's the first thing that you have to ask yourself if you're trying to figure out if you can represent them both? Exactly. Do they have conflicting interests? Okay, so um, Frank, what do you think? If they have conflicting interests, what's the conflict? Well, the, okay, so, what kind of they have? Um, okay, Ms. Smith, what conflict do you think they have? Um, well, if the husband had been forging the signature on the tax return, she's mm -hmm. obviously going to want to not be held liable for their mm -hmm. fraud that they've committed, so committing his interest and in not being found guilty in her interest in, you know, being separated from him. Okay, so remember that at this point, the only people who know that that signature was forged are the Burks, right? And it is in Mr. Burke's interest that nobody know that the signatures were forged. Because if he forges that, if they know, if the government knows that he forged the signatures, he could be liable for, he, for criminal penalties. On the other hand, from Mrs. Burke's point of view, if, if, um, it's made clear that the signatures were forged, then she's out of it, right? She has no liability. So that's the conflict. That's the problem. So um, there's an ABA model rule 1.7. And this is a rule on um, lawyers representing clients that are, have conflicting interests. So um, the first thing is that you have to be subjectively confident that you can serve both parties diligently. And you're supposed to, uh, um, to be reasonable in that belief. So you have to have a reasonable belief in your ability to serve both clients. In this situation, you can't have that reasonable belief. The second thing is, if you have the reasonable belief, we're doing um, problem 1-3, and the problem is um, deals with whether a, a lawyer could represent both Mr. and Mrs. Burke in the um, litigation that we studied in the Burke case. So then the second thing you have to do is you have to explain the conflict. So you have to actually explain the conflict to the clients. And then you have to get the um, written consent of both the clients. Now, it doesn't actually require the written consent. I'm just saying to you, get the written consent. You have to get the consent of both clients.
and it would be better in writing. And the penalty for non-compliance, at the very least, is that the local bar should uh, um, take away your, pra your license to practice. So it's a pretty big deal. So that's that part. Um, so let's go back to you, Mr. Shu. Let's do the next problem, which is what? 1 dash 4? So in 1 dash 4, we have a um, single person with no dependents. And um, this person has gotten um, $30,000 of, um, here it says net earnings, but let's say gross earnings from um, self-employment. So what would um, that person's gross income be under Section 61? would be $30,000. Now let's say that this person um, had above the line deductions of $5,000. Then what's the person's adjusted gross income going to be? Okay, adjusted gross income would be $25,000. So now, under Section 63, what is the person's um, choice in terms of how they take their um, deductions? OK, so they have to select between, between the standard deduction or their Schedule A, right, itemized deductions, thank you, which are also called below the line deductions. Now here, we're not given any below the line deductions. So, does anybody, I'm just opening this up to anybody, does anybody remember the code section for the standard deduction? 63. Oh, close. 73? 63. I think it's 63. Let's go back. Let's look. What is 73? Section 73 is services of a child. <laughs> Treatment of amounts received for services of a child. Okay, thank you. But it was close. Okay, so it's 63C2C because this person is single. So it's 63C2C. To cap C. And that amount is $3,000. Now, what's the other deduction that this person gets to take? Okay, that's for, that's, that is the, um, 
the tax on Social Security and medical. But in terms of taxable income, you either take the standard deduction or the Schedule A and something else. What's the and? I open it to anybody. What's the and? Yeah. The personal exemption. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Personal exemption, which is in Section 151D, and it's $2,000. So what's the taxable income, Mr. Zhu? $20,000. Okay, I just want to make sure that I gave you the right um, code section for the exemption. Yes, it's um, D1. So this person has $20,000 of taxable income. So now, um, Ms. Han, do you know what section we're going to look at to see um, what the uh, tax rate is? Section one. Section one. Okay. And within section one, if she's a single person with no children, which subsection of section one are we going to look at? C. Yes, section 1C. Okay, so we're going to do the tax rate for section 1C. And the reason why we're using 1C is that she's a single person with no dependents. And so what's the tax rate, Ms. Han? Not the amount, just the rate. I'm sure because the, uh, the rate is uh, the amount of adjustment. Oh, just what's, that, what's in the code, not, not whatever's adjusted. But she's making a good point. Because remember that, like for example, I said here the standard deduction was 3000 and here the personal exemption was 2000 But if you look at your tax return, you'll see that the personal exemption is 3900 and I can't even remember what the standard deduction is. Does anybody have their tax return? It's on line 40 on the left-hand side in the... Okay, for, for a single person? $6,100. Okay, so how did that happen? Ms. Han is correct. It happened through inflation adjustments. But we're just using the, the um, numbers in the code just to get us through the code. Woo! So what would be the 15%? Uh, so the tax due would be $20,000 times 15% would be $3,000. So now, Ms. Smith, the second Ms. Smith, um, we have another question here. And that question is, what is her, oh, you don't know that. What is her Social Security and Medicare tax liability for the year? Okay, so you don't know that. Don't even worry about it. It's, um, there's a point to this, though, so I'll get back to you. So there's a question about Medicare and Social Security. Okay, so Section 1401A gives the percentage that is owed by self-employed people for Social Security. So it's for Social Security, C, 
self-employed. And that is 12.4%. Now this 12.4% cuts off at a, um, at a particular point, and unfortunately, I don't think that my code has that, that section in it because that would be too much like right. No, it doesn't have it in there, but it's about $130,000. It'll cut off. Then there's um, 1401B, and that's the Medicare. And that is 2.9%. So the total is 15.3%. So now, Ms. Smith, the question, one question is, what is her marginal federal tax rate? So the tax rate on her last dollar of income under the federal tax, the federal income tax? 15%. 15%. And uh, um, Mr. Bohan, what is, this next question is, what is her marginal tax rate um, if we include the Social Security and Medicare tax. So then do you, do you add that to the 15.3%? Yes, you would add, well, the 15.3% is the Medicare. Right. So, so in addition to the 15%? Yeah. Part, so that would be 30.3%. Okay, 30.3%. And this is what she's actually going to pay. She's going to pay 30.3%. Now, um, the next question is, uh, um, what would her marginal federal tax rate be if she had taxable income of a million dollars this year? Ms. Lee, what do you think? Do you have your code with you? You just need to look at section, all of you need to look at section 1C. And if she had a million dollars this year, what would her marginal rate be? Uh, 39.6%. Okay, so the reason that that question gets asked is if you think about vertical equity, people are, and, and progressive taxes, people constantly focus on only the federal income tax. And when they look at the federal income tax, they would say, oh, well, this person who has $20,000 pays 15%, and this person who has a million dollars pays 39.6%, so this person is paying twice as much as this other person, and so we have vertical equity. But remember that a person who has a million dollars in income, first of all, mostly is getting that income from capital gains. And capital gains are taxed at 15%. That's why Mitt Romney had such a low tax rate, and why he had to give up over $2 million of deductions just to get a 10% tax rate because most of what he was being taxed on was at this 15%. But in addition, even if they're being taxed at the 39.6%, this 15.3% cuts off very quickly for them. So the difference between the rates, when you add in what all of you are going to end up paying in terms of Social Security and Medicare is not nearly as steep. So that's the only point of that. So that will take us to um, the next question is, 
Assume that Microsoft has various employee compensation plans, and it also hires an army of people whom they treat as independent contractors. Okay. Did you do anything about independent contractors in any of your other courses? Do you have any sort of sense of what an independent contractor would be? Okay, Mr. Marshall, what course was it? Okay, maybe um, labor law? Employment? Okay, so let me just tell you what's the big whoop about independent contractors. What? What, Mr. Nixon? Sorry, no. no. Oh, it had nothing to do, okay. All right. Um, okay, remember that we talked about how we're in a current payment system? And, um, so, Mr. Wu, what are the ways that the government creates this current payment system? So, remember we said, if you think that you're paying your taxes on April 15th, you're not really paying your taxes on April 15th, you're supposed to pay beforehand, you're supposed to pay as you go. So, what's one way that you pay as you go? What are the ways that the government creates the current payment system? So how is it that, like, if you have a job now, how do you know that you've already paid your taxes? Right, but, no, but for your federal income taxes, yeah, every time you make a purchase, you've paid your sales taxes, but how do I know, looking at you, that you have paid your federal income taxes? If you're an employee, I know you've paid them. Withholding. And then, Mr. Nixon, you wanted to say something? What? Oh, the withholding, but what's the second way? Right, but that's, that's not a current payment system. What's the other thing for people who, yes, Mr. Wu? Quarterly obligation. What? Quarterly. The quarterly obligation to pay estimated taxes. Okay, so between your obligation, if you don't have withholding, to pay estimated taxes and the employer's obligation to withhold, we're in a current payment system. So, the obligation to withhold taxes, an employer is only obligated to withhold taxes on a person who's an employee. So if you are, don't fall under the, the um, heading of employee, then there's no obligation to withhold. In addition, we were looking at um, social security taxes and Medicare taxes. And when we looked at that problem, when I said to Ms. Smith, you don't know this because we haven't covered it, right? When we were looking at 1401A and B, we were looking at self-employed people. And that's where we came up with that 15.3%. But if you are an employee, your employer is supposed to pay half of that. Now remember we talked about this concept of incidence of taxation. And incidence of taxation asks the question, who truly pays the tax? So for example, like when Mr. Wu was saying, he knows that he pays the taxes because every time he buys something, he pays the taxes. Now, technically, 
He's not paying the taxes. The person selling the goods is paying the taxes over to the government. But Mr. Wu is exactly correct. He's the one paying the taxes because the incidence of taxation falls on him. So that was a completely correct statement. When it comes to this um, employer one half obligation, the employer may be paying over the tax, but the incidence of taxation still falls on the employee. Right? The employer is lowering your income in order to make up for the obligation to pay. Now, nevertheless, employers are constantly trying to get out of this requirement towards employees. And the way they do this is by setting up people as independent contractors. And the tax law distinguishes between employees and independent contractors in the same way that employment law does. So an independent contractor is somebody who's just hired to get a result. And the, the person who hires them does not control how they get the result. So, for example, if you get hired by someone to be their attorney, they can't tell you, well, you can't work on this at 3 o'clock in the morning. You have to work on it between 9 and 5. That's not their business, right? They hired you to get a result. On the other hand, if you get hired by a law firm, they can tell you you have to be here at certain times, you can't be here at other times, you have to dress a certain way or any of that, right? So um, businesses are constantly trying to turn employees into independent contractors in order to avoid these sorts of payments. And in fact, that's what Microsoft did. Yes, Mr. Martucci. Well, unpaid interns, I have no idea what they would be under employment law. But since they're unpaid, they don't have to withhold and they don't have to pay their Social Security. So it doesn't come up in a tax sense. Does anybody remember from employment law what an unpaid intern? It's probably as a volunteer. As a volunteer? Yeah. I, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't, I don't know. Um, but in any event, there was a case called Viscano versus Microsoft. And what happened in that case was that um, it's a Ninth Circuit 1997 case. I don't know why you'd want to look it up, but if you do, it's a Ninth Circuit case. And what happened in that case was that Microsoft had many, many people that it treated as independent contractors that um, the court found were actually employees. So what this question goes to is the question of pension funding. So remember when we talked about income taxes versus consumption taxes. So in an income tax, the trigger is the earning of income. And in a consumption tax, the trigger is spending. So if you have an income tax and you have A and you have B, and they each earn $100, and the tax is 10%, each one of them should pay $10. On the other hand, if you have a consumption tax and the rate is 10%, and A spends $100, A's tax will be $10. But if B only spends $50, then his tax will only be $5 because the trigger is the spending. So remember that we also said that even though our tax is called an income tax, 
it's actually a combined income and consumption tax. So sometimes you have an income tax and sometimes you have a consumption tax. And where you have a consumption tax in our tax system is in pensions. So you've heard of 401k plans and 403b plans and 457 plans. All of these are pension plans and they all or, or IRAs. And they all work the same way, which is if you put money into an account that's designated under one of these plans, you are not taxed on that money. So, for example, in our income tax, if B earns $100 and he puts $50 in a regular savings account, he's taxed on $100. But if he earns $100 and he puts $50 in one of these accounts, he'll only be taxed on $50. That's what makes it a consumption tax. And then whatever interest or capital gains or whatever is earned in that account is also not taxed until the moment that the monies are pulled out. Now, when these first started, what happened was that employers set them up so that the employers got the benefit of the plan and the employees didn't. So like if you think about a law firm, none of the secretaries, none of the office people, none of the associates were allowed into the pension plan. Only the partners were allowed into the pension plan. So what happened was the law was changed to say if you set up a pension plan, everybody has to be able to participate in that pension plan. You can have certain vesting requirements, um, but they can't be onerous. Like you can't say 20 years to vest. You can say two years to vest. You can say five years to vest. You can't say 20 years to vest. So when this case um, resolved that the people that Microsoft was calling independent contractors were actually employees, all of them had to be covered retroactively under that pension plan in order for the pension plan to survive. That's all about that. So then, um, the last question has to do with um, that same person that we had before who had the uh, um, $30,000 of income. And this person has a twin who has $35,000 from investments. So you have the person who's working and you have the investor. And let's say they each have $30,000 in income. The question goes to deductions because it asks, are they really paying the same tax? Because this person has to commute, but there's no deduction. This person has to have work clothes, no deduction. This person has to get daycare, no deduction, although there is a credit for child care that we'll get into later. Um, and so that person has all these costs associated with earning their living, Whereas, according to this problem, the investor just hangs out in her pajamas and calls 800 numbers. And so the question is, can you have horizontal equity under these rules? Anybody want to opine on this issue? Okay. 
Maybe not. Do you see what the do you see what the issue is? There are two different things going on. The first has to do with rates. So if you want to have horizontal equity, um, you need the same rates. Like for example, remember we talked about scheduler systems? So scheduler taxes, what they do is they pick different types of income and they tax those incomes at different rates. In our system, we only have two schedules. We have ordinary income which goes up to 39.6% and capital gains, which goes up to 15%. So based on the rates, we can't have horizontal equity because we have different rates depending on different types of income. The other way that horizontal equity can be undercut is through deductions. So if you have one person who just collects $300,000 a year, they have money in the bank, they get interest, they don't have to do anything except open the checks and deposit them. On the other hand, you're, you will have started a law firm and you have gross billings of $300,000 a year, but you have utility payments, you have um, rent payments, you have salary payments. If you were not allowed to deduct any of those payments and you were taxed on $300,000, even if you were at the same rate, you would have to say, well, there's no horizontal equity here because one person is getting $300,000 without any payments out and taxed at, let's say, 15%, and the other person has all these costs associated with the income and is still being taxed on the gross at 15%. That's what this problem is meant to illustrate. OK, so just to warn you, when we have the next class, I'm going to ask those people who took um, the regulatory state class to help explain to those people who did not take the regulatory st um, state class what are the rules of statutory interpretation that you have found most helpful in understanding your work in law school? So there are, um, from page 40 to page 42, there's a um, discussion of the various rules of statutory construction. And I believe that you have gone over these rules of statutory construction in the uh, regulatory state class. But there are people in this class who have not taken the regulatory state class. And so I'm going to ask you all, which of these have you found the most helpful? Like intentionalist, textualist, purposivist, which I can't even pronounce. Um, or things like the general language is limited by specific phrases, et cetera, and so on. So that's what we're going to do next class. A lot of um, the reading in chapter two, we actually went over in terms of chapter one. And that's it for today.